Vitamin C is one of the most widely used supplements out there, especially when it comes to boosting immunity and treating colds. Unfortunately, over the last couple of years, several studies and analysis have come out saying that vitamin C isn't actually that effective, especially when it comes to avoiding or reducing cold symptoms. Some have even called it useless. In this video, I want to summarize the current literature on vitamin C, explain if it really helps with colds and overall improved immunity, and also show you how to supplement vitamin C correctly for optimal results. To start off, what does vitamin C actually do? It's an essential nutrient that you need to get from the foods you eat that helps with a lot of things in your body. In terms of immune function, it is necessary for the formation of white blood cells, which you need to help fight infections. It is also a very powerful antioxidant, probably the most well-known out there. Everyone knows vitamin C. Antioxidants basically help reduce the damage from free radicals, and these free radicals can be anything. They can come from inside your body, but they can also come from toxins, pollutants, or anything that might harm you and your health. Because of these reasons, for a long time, vitamin C was the go-to supplement for many sick people, usually those that had a cold or flu or any type of infection, both bacterial or viral. But in recent years, more and more studies have come out that question the effectiveness of vitamin C in regards to immunity, especially when it comes to colds. Some have concluded that it's less effective than previously thought, and others have even called it useless. Let me now summarize the current scientific literature on vitamin C to explain why this is the case. There are many individual studies on vitamin C, but the most important are two meta-analyses from 2013 and 2018. The first is called vitamin C for preventing and treating the common cold, and the second is called extra dose of vitamin C based on a daily supplementation shortens the common cold a meta-analysis of nine randomized controlled trials. This second study, which initially found a significant effect, was later retracted due to errors in calculation. So in the following summary, I will focus mostly on the 2013 meta-analysis, along with a few notable individual studies that look at athletes. If we summarize their insights, we can say that one, people who start vitamin C supplements when they already have a cold don't see much benefit. Really, the only effect was seen when they used very high doses, so several grams of vitamin C. Two, people who take vitamin C supplements regularly can expect shorter colds, but not by much. Around 8% in adults and 14% in children. And they can also expect slightly less severe symptoms. And lastly, a few studies showed that athletes who took vitamin C daily were half as likely to catch a cold when compared to athletes who took a placebo. For example, one study of ultramarathon runners, so those that run more than 42 kilometers, were given 600 milligrams per day, and after the race, one-third of the supplement group got sick, whereas two-thirds of the placebo group got sick. Based on these studies, the conclusion was that vitamin C supplements can sometimes shorten the duration of colds, but they don't seem to prevent them, unless you are an athlete under acute stress, for example, from the ultramarathon race that I just mentioned. This then led to many journalists and websites saying that vitamin C is overrated and useless. But is this true? Should we really draw that conclusion? And should we throw out our vitamin C supplements? I would say no. Let me explain why. The problem with vitamin studies is that they often look at isolated nutrients, in this case vitamin C, to test a certain hypothesis, in this case the reduction of cold symptoms. And the symptom reduction is also used as a proxy to gauge vitamin C's immune boosting effects. The studies usually assume that there are no confounding variables and a clear cause and effect relationship between the vitamin C and the immune response. They have to, to get a yes or no answer to the hypothesis being tested. The results are then the average of the participants' outcomes. That means outliers are usually averaged out, and you look at what you're left with. This also has to be done to make studies more feasible and to ensure comparability of results. 
In theory, this is fine, but in practice, you lose a lot of nuance and all the context. This is a problem that almost all nutrition studies face. From what I can tell, most of the studies did not measure the participants' nutrients levels before they gave them the vitamin C supplement. And if they did, they only used blood markers, which are a terrible representation of tissue levels where nutrients are actually stored. They also didn't distinguish between the two main types of vitamin C, whole food versus ascorbic acid, so synthetic vitamin C. And lastly, because they average out the participants' results, all the outliers are omitted. But they are the most interesting group because they have the most extreme reactions to the supplement. Now, I'm not knocking on the study design here or the scientists. They do very important work and are usually aware of their own study's limitations. But most journalists and the average person isn't. If they see the conclusion that vitamin C didn't really help, then they will believe it, and they will think that it applies to all situations and all cases. Let me now explain why this isn't the case, and also tell you how to supplement vitamin C correctly if you want to boost your immune system. I explain the basics in a different video in much more detail, but what you have to understand is that your immune system is a network of organs, cells, and antibodies that all depend on certain nutrients to function optimally. And these nutrients need to be balanced and work together for best results. In terms of vitamins, the most important ones are vitamins A, C, and D. And in terms of minerals, we're mostly looking at zinc and copper. Now, even though nutrient status is always highly individual and I don't like to make general statements, most people, so maybe 70 to 80%, will be low in vitamin C, vitamin D, and zinc and they also have too much biounavailable copper, so it sits in the tissue and cannot be used properly by the body. Vegetarians and vegans also have a higher risk of being low in vitamin A, which is primarily found in animal products. Beta-carotene from plants doesn't count here because it's a vitamin precursor, so it first has to be converted into bioactive vitamin A in the body, and this conversion doesn't work right in everyone. Also keep in mind that we're often talking about subclinical deficiencies here. So they might not show up on a blood test, but will on a more specific test like a hair analysis. If you want to evaluate the effectiveness of vitamin C for your immune system, you have to see it in the context of these nutrients. You have to understand how they affect each other and how they work together. In someone with a lot of unbound copper, so a lot of biounavailable copper, vitamin C will be beneficial because it lowers copper in the body. Whole food vitamin C also helps produce ceruloplasmin, which is the primary copper binding protein. Once the copper is bioavailable again and the excess unbound copper has been eliminated, your immune system will be much more effective because not only can it now use copper to fight off viruses and bacteria, you will also no longer be copper dominant, which means the zinc in your body will no longer be suppressed. Zinc is crucial for a well-functioning immune system. If, however, you're not copper dominant before taking a supplement, but you're copper deficient, and then you're given a high-dose vitamin C supplement, it will probably backfire because it will further lower your copper status. This applies especially to isolated vitamin C, so ascorbic acid, and not so much to low-dose whole food vitamin C supplements but ascorbic acid is still the most widely available vitamin C supplement. Another situation where giving someone vitamin C would backfire is when they have high adrenal function. Your adrenal glands are one of the organs with the highest concentration of vitamin C in them, and they really rely on vitamin C for optimal functioning. If you give vitamin C to someone whose adrenals are already working overtime and who's already very stressed, it can overstimulate that person. They will feel giddy, unwell, and anxious. What that means is that the effectiveness of vitamin C and also the right dosage always depends on the context and who you're working with. General statements like it's super useful or it's always useless don't really mean anything without knowing the person. I hope this helped you understand how complex the topic of vitamin C supplementation really is and also how studies even when they're done right, can be misleading. To wrap up this video, I now want to give you a practical guide on short-term supplementation for your immune system. 
Like I said before, the most important nutrients here are vitamins A, C, and D, as well as zinc and copper. For long-term supplementation, so taking something longer than a couple of days, please always get your nutrient levels tested. But assuming you only supplement for a few days and want to acutely improve your immune response, you can do the following. Increase your vitamin A and D intake, preferably through natural sources such as cod liver oil. I explain what to look for in a quality cod liver oil in a different video. In terms of vitamin C, I recommend whole food supplements like acerola extract. You can buy all these vitamins in their synthetic versions, so ascorbic acid for vitamin C, retinol palmitate or retinol acetate for vitamin A, and cholecalciferol for vitamin D. They will be cheaper and higher dosed, but you also have to be more careful, because they also come with nutrient interactions that many people aren't aware of. I have a video on how to take each of these vitamins correctly, so make sure to check it out if you're interested. And lastly, in terms of zinc and copper, you can go with a low-dose zinc supplement and should be careful with copper supplements. That's because for copper to be effective in your immune response, it needs to be bioavailable and bound to a carrier protein. Many people already have too much biounavailable copper in their tissue, and a copper supplement can potentially add to that overload. If you suspect to be copper toxic, please watch my video on it to understand this dichotomy. Also, if you get side effects from any of the supplements I just mentioned, please reach out to a professional. These are just suggestions and everyone has a different tolerance to supplements. That's basically it. I hope you liked this video and I see you in the next one.